This conference will now be recorded. Well, hello and welcome to APS Stamp Chat, everyone who's looking on live and for our YouTube audience. My name's Heidi Rhodes. Today's guest is Mr. Sterling Hedgepath, who joins us from the Bay Area in California. Sterling has been working in and around the film industry his entire adult life. He has a BA in English and film from UC Berkeley and an MA in film archival studies from the University of East Anglica, Norwich from the United Kingdom. He serves as the Noir Ambassador for Turner Classic Movies, and he has been attending Westpex faithfully for over two decades and was profiled by Stamp Magazine, again in the United Kingdom, in January 2014. He's the creator of the blog, The Film Atalyst, The Unholy Marriage of Film and Posted Stamps. Today's Stamp Chat is sponsored by the American Philatelic Society's Education Department. Our education department of the APS supports its members with education for all levels. Young Stamp Collectors of America for our youngest collectors, Young Philatelic Leaders Fellowship or YPLF for aspiring young philatelists, and Summer Seminar, a once a year opportunity to learn from philatelic experts. Make sure to also check out C3A, an on-demand online learning tool containing videos, learning modules, and more. Learning never ends with philately. To learn more about what the education department is working on, visit stamps.org or email education at stamps.org. And now for our feature presentation, Filmately, Movies and Film, and Movies and Postage Stamps. Thank you, Sterling, and welcome. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for joining uh, us, everyone. Um, let me preface this by saying my pursuits in the hobby are certainly are nothing but amateur hour. You know, I am a film professional. I am a stamp enthusiast. And even though I'm going to cover a lot about movies, this is as much about personalizing a collection, taking an enthusiasm and holding it as your own. I know that sometimes uh, attending Westpex, attending a conference can be really intimidating, the amount of history, the amount of jargon and technical rules around philately can be impenetrable if you don't know exactly where to come from. And, and for me, building my collection, 95% of it, which is original, material. Uh, building it has been just a labor of love just because I love movies and I love uh, the digging into the world of stamps. Um, so I don't know how much of this is right or wrong or according to Hoyle, but uh, we can talk about that more uh, later. This is just an overview of how I built my collection and how fellow amateur enthusiasts can build theirs in a similar way. So I'll start by simply saying that um, uh, I had a neighbor who, when he uh, graduated high school, he uh, he was a Boy Scout and he gifted me his stamp collection, uh, which was sort of developing. You know, it was a lot of the things where you you take uh, existing stamps and you see which ones you can fill in the in the right placements. And that was my first exposure to it. Although I was born in Ecuador, and when we moved to the states, I got lots of. Um, I got lots of mail from my family. Almost all my family still lives in Ecuador. So I got a lot of mail from them and I love saving the stamps. So that was also a personal connection to me. But the first time I ever really thought about movies and posted stamps was when I went to uh, college. My freshman year was also the year that the Films of 39 uh, was uh, issued. And that was the first time uh, films uh, that were specifically referenced, as opposed to just a director or a movie star, uh, were issued on a United States postage stamp. And uh, I found that really interesting. Also, moving to the Bay Area from the Southern California suburbs meant that I actually was around stamp stores and collectible stores, which meant that I could find um, interesting things. This this uh, 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 souvenir sheet, uh, an excerpt from a souvenir sheet, I think it's from Egypt, but I'm not 100% sure off the hand was the first time I saw something where really cool, interesting movies and interesting movie personalities was, were on postage stamps internationally. Um, and so being able to, ex being exposed to that was a really interesting way for me to start poking my nose into um, the world of 
uh, stamp collecting. Um, what I what I found was that uh, the first thing I did was I went to uh, a lot of different Scott uh, catalog guides. I found that the public library had all of the international ones. So I was able to pour over them because I, I got a hold of a topical guide, and but there were no film topical uh, guides. They were all entertainment, which meant they were pretty much just celebrity driven. These are all movie stamps. They all celebrate film, film industries, film festivals, but they wouldn't show up in any topical guide. So I found that if I really wanted to dig deep into the world of film as represented on postage stamps, I had to do a lot of the research firsthand. And so I did that a lot. Um, I started digging through that. And then, of course, that developed a wish list. And from that wish list, I started as attending uh, Westpex. And Westpex was uh, really interesting. Now, this was before most, uh, there was a, there is a, and I suppose continues to be a huge surge of souvenir sheets that celebrate films. This was kind of before that was really happening much. So most of the films, uh, most of the film related stamps were ones that were easily, uh, easy to find simply just because they were individual stamps that I could assemble in my collection. Uh, but what I found is the, the, the more recent issues uh, were so recent that um, a lot of the, the Westpex vendors just didn't have them in their inventory. Uh, and so then I had to explore what else I could do with movies and postage stamps. And one of the things I found was that every once in a while, periodically, I'd show, I'd see, uh, there'd be caches or caches, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, uh, but you'd have the envelope ones. But every once in a while, they showed up on a postage stamp as well. And that really intrigued me because I, uh, there was a proliferation of novelty postcard stores all through the Bay Area in Berkeley and San Francisco. and a, a very common thing to uh, to reproduce on postage stamps were uh, movie poster one sheets. Um, and given that movie posters usually ran thirty five dollars uh, an item, uh, being able to have a poster of a one sheet and have a on a postcard and have a collection of those postcards for me was something that I was already assembling. So now here came the idea. I picked up these at the convention. Um, uh, here was the idea that I could actually apply a postage stamp to a postcard related to that movie or perhaps another movie uh, and then find uh, a way to get a first day of issue stamp on a postmark on that. So so that's where the, my two enthusiasms about movies and movie posters and then the possibility of stamps uh, where they converge in exactly this particular type or manifestation of the hobby specifically on postcards. That's what I started exploring. Uh, so the first time I, I gave this a try, oh, and I want to mention, you know, I know that there's a there's a whole subculture of just maximum cards in the in the Philatel community. So a lot of and emphasis was on having a stamp uh, reflect the exact image on the postcard. And so see, these are some examples of ones that I have in my collection, but I knew, I, there's no way I could explore movies and postcards and have them be maximum cards per se. I knew that I would have to be a little bit more creative or a little bit more innovative about how I use them um, on postcards that would not fall into the maximum card world, but I have a few examples of those in my collection, of course, for sure. So, um, so what I did my first time, uh, here's some, uh, Charlie Chaplin ended up being the most represented at the time, at least the most represented uh, film figure on international philately. But the, but, um, the United States, uh, he showed up once in the Celebrate the Century series, but there was gonna be a huge um, 10, 10 stamp piece on the, the Legends of Silence, silent film. And the induction ceremony of that uh, collection uh, or that issue was uh, going to be at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. So I attended that ceremony. Uh, Carl Malden was the guest speaker uh, because he was on the, I believe he was on the board of directors for, for the USPS Philately uh, section. Um, and, and it was a really interesting, it was a really interesting ceremony. And that was my first attempt at actually bringing some postcards with the post stamps on them. I actually had to buy the stamps at the ceremony fix them on site and then get the postmarks. This is the best looking one. Most of them ended up coming away, walking away kind of smudged. So I had, because I had so many of them, I had no way of separating them out. I didn't quite know even what to expect, but that was the first time I actually ever even tried 
my hand at building uh, an in, a, a postcard like the one that I've been concentrating on now. Um, so what happened after that was, uh, let's take a look. Um, uh, that, that's when, soon after the Legends of Hollywood series uh, started getting issued and the first was Marilyn Monroe. And I happened to actually be in Los Angeles at the time. So I, again, you'll see Universal City. I went to the post, the postmaster uh, office of that particular stamp issue. There on the first day, I had a, I, a, a huge stack of Marilyn Monroe postcards and I bought the stamps on site. I, I, uh, I applied all of them on site. Um, just in the corner at the post office. It took a while. Just, these are these were before self adhesive, so I was licking all day. Um, but then I ended up putting them all together and then mailing them with the self addressed stamped envelope, uh, so that way um, I could get the results back. So I was really excited about that. But I'll admit I was still very conservative. I still felt that there may be some rule about whether I could have fixed it on the front or not. Um, so most of them looked like this. Um, and what ended up, and that ended up being sort of a, re, a regret on my part. Uh, I ended up deciding that after I got all those back, over the years I would continue to, uh, over the years I would continue to have um, cards that I use uh, on the reverse side to supplement with either additional stamps or a Maryland stamp with a with another type of stamp as well. Um, the second time I did that uh, was obviously with the James Dean one. And uh, that was the second uh, Legends of Hollywood. And the James Dean one was kind of a mess. Um, as you can see, that is a terrible postmark. And I was really upset by that. And because I put so many of them on the face, they all look like that on the image side. And, and it was just really disappointing. It was really poorly handled. Um, since then, I've tried to supplement it with, again, uh, uh, post uh, stamps that might somehow complement the imagery in some way. This Andrew Wyeth one had really muted grays, and so that was about as close as I think I was going to get, um, just so I could have a way to correct some of the errors that the this original uh, stamp batch uh, that I received got. That, that was a really disappointing, but it was also a good lesson for me to learn uh, subsequently. And from every single uh, first day of issue request since, I always put that little verbiage over on the left, just because to make it completely unambiguous to make it completely clear what my intentions are. I try to make it very, 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 very simple to organize. So that way, um, I know I know there's someone hand stamping each one of those and, and I want to respect the, the fact that, you know, they're, they're doing a good job. I'm always very grateful for that, but I want to make sure that they're, that they're done right as well. Um, and from that point on, that's pretty much how I continue to build this collection, you know, individual films, uh, individual stars would come out year after year after year, and I'd start building uh, building postcard collections from that. Sometimes it would be uh, glamour shots uh, or studio portrait shots. Sometimes they would be the one sheet uh, of a film that that person was in. Um, and eventually we got to the point where legends started co-starring with other legends. And so I started combining as often as I could uh, one first day of issue uh, cover postmark with a second. Um, and then after that, uh, I was thinking, well, what about other stamps in uh, postal in US history? You know, um, the, there was a, the stage productions uh, of Showboat at Oklahoma and My Fair Lady. And this stamp looks so closely like the one on the movie poster itself. It seemed ridiculous not to at least try to include it in the assembly. So uh, this was the Audrey Hepburn first day of issue um, with uh, with the My Fair Lady stamp. And from there, I started just going through more and more possibilities of how I could use other supplemental stamps in addition to the the stamp that was getting recognized. Uh, sometimes, you know, Philadelphia Story. Uh, there were multiple uh, multiple actors that I wanted to include in one batch. Um, the Grace Kelly stamp came out well before any of the Legends of Hollywood ones, but she ended up being used again and again whenever I saw High Noon or Rear Window or Dial M for Murder uh, come up uh, with, you know, either Gary Cooper or Alfred Hitchcock or whomever. Um, so the idea of having additional supplemental material to complement the primary stamp in a way that uh, spoke specifically to the film 
being celebrated on the postcard was something that uh, I tried to concentrate on as much as possible. Um, at this point, this is where we kind of go into a three-stage uh, set of ideals. You know, the first is uh, using stamps that have a direct uh, reference to the film. Uh, the second will be using stamps that have an indirect reference to the film. And the third is using stamps that have no real direct reference at all, but it's more of maybe of a conceptual reference. Um, so we'll look a, a little bit at different examples of that uh, over the over the course of the years I've been doing this. Of course, uh, adaptations from literature means that if you can pull a Her Herman Melville or an Ernest Hemingway stamp uh, to add, that always works really great. Um, and oh, I should say that because um, because we have so many visuals, I'm going to pile drive through all these stamps very quickly. But because it's being recorded, you can always go back and look at the stamps in more detail because we're going to be dealing with a lot of stamps on a lot of postcards just to give you the breadth and show the variety of ways that this can be deployed. Um, of course, another major after the Legends of Hollywood series, uh, there was another major uh, issue of uh, Hollywood directors from uh, John Huston to Frank Capra to John Ford. And so that was an opportunity to continue to add another layer of uh, first day of issue uh, reference on some of these postcards. Um, John Huston, of course, not only a director, but an actor, starred in Chinatown. And if you've seen that movie, water conservation uh, is a major issue in that film. So that seemed like a perfect marriage. Um, not only was uh, Charlton Heston in the film uh, Planet of the Apes, but uh, Rod Serling from Twilight Zone wrote the screenplay. And so when that, when that entire TV series came out, um, people like uh, Phil Silvers or Raymond Burr or Lucille Ball, uh, who were being recognized for television, might still be used for film purposes on some of my postcards. So that's where that idea came through too. Um, Another major, major release uh, for the film uh, stamps are, was the American filmmaking series, which celebrated different disciplines within, uh, within the, the, the craft and the artistic um, efforts of uh, film. And so this also gave me another opportunity to not only celebrate films using, using a stamp like that, but also uh, revisit films or revisit stamps that I couldn't do uh, I couldn't get uh, covers of before and, and use them as part of a larger uh, uh, stamp assembly on a postcard. So we have um, uh, E.T. was in Celebrate the Century for the 80s. Uh, I did not get, uh, in, some, in some cases, I was already doing some Celebrate the Century stuff, but I just didn't have an E.T. postcard at the time. But now I did, and so now is my opportunity to use it. Um, similarly, uh, the, the universal horror film uh, monsters, I was out of the country when those came out. Uh, but here's my opportunity to use them now for either uh, wedding stamps or uh, Halloween stamps for both uh, The Bride of Frankenstein and here uh, The Mummy. Um, and then of course, we're, we're going back to the films of 39 again because I didn't have any relationship, I didn't have any material for the films of 39, other than maybe a couple caches or something that I had picked up at Westpac's, um, and I had some of the original stamps, but now is an opportunity to build on those stamps, especially since, uh, for, Mac, for example, the, the American filmmaking series, the one that says screenwriting, the text in that stamp is from Gone with the Wind. Um, so that is some dialogue from the film. Uh, at that, over the years, Hayden McDaniel, Margaret Mitchell, um, Welcome to Georgia, uh, Gone with the Wind, the book, uh, some Confederate generals, they were all opportunities to include those onto that particular uh, uh, postcard over the years using different first day of issue opportunities. Uh, similarly, um, sometimes finding a cache meant that I could build on that already. So this, this is something that you would probably find at a lot of different conventions, uh, simply because this was a mass-produced uh, cache for Gone with the Wind, but my ability to layer a few additional stamps on there meant that there were more stamps visible, and it's it, it was very this one was very nicely done. It's very clean uh, that it shows uh, the 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 evolution of 
that particular title or franchise over the years as they manifested in stamps. Um, sometimes uh, with the caches, uh, uh, this was originally just a, sta a blank envelope with the first movie stamp ever issued in the world, the 1944 50th anniversary of motion pictures from the United States. Um, so this was originally just a blank stamp and then a blank envelope and then someone uh, laser printed uh, a movie poster of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington on top of that. That's actually a 1939 stamp, that 1939 film that wasn't recognized on the issue, but it also was a film that I did not have a postcard of. So here was an opportunity to add Frank Capra when he came up, to add not only Jimmy Stewart, but some uh, iconography from Washington DC as they show in stamps uh, as an opportunity to supplement uh, the original stamp, but also to complement the movie that was being celebrated on the, the laser printed version, even if that was after the fact. Um, similarly, uh, I didn't have a postcard for Pride of the Yankees and this, uh, and this Pride of the Yankees poster really doesn't supplement the original stamp. It's just a regular US flag. Um, but someone did it, and I found it at Westpex. And so once Gary Cooper got his stamp, I, I, I layered uh, Lou Gehrig and uh, the Yankee Stadium on there too, and and and, and built out that cachet. So it it became something that was no longer mass produced, but something that uh, was more singularly unique. Um, going back to the films of, uh, oh, that's right. Okay, so next comes um, Disney. This this is. This, I guess, begs the question, how many stamps is too many stamps on a postcard? This is a slightly oversized postcard, but still, um, as you know, Disney had five years of consecutive releases uh, with three films on each uh, release, three Disney films on each release and one Mickey Mouse stamp on each release. So it was a block of four on a sheet of 20, uh, five years in a row. Uh, this uh, postcard of Fantasia has all five Mickey's represented in five consecutive years with first day of issue covers. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, that was an opportunity to add uh, to add music instruments, dinosaurs, uh, ballet, all of which appear in, um, in Fantasia. Also uh, Fantasia uh, won Oscars for both uh, Walt Disney and Leopold Stokowski uh, using music by Igor Stravinsky. So it seemed to make sense to add those stamps uh, to this American, uh, American filmmaking uh, music uh, postcard, music postmark as well. So this was, so obviously when the Disney one came out, there were a zillion other postcards that I was able to find that were specific to those films. Going to downtown Disney, the mall outside of the parks, meant you could find hundreds of different kinds of postcards. So that was one, of, that was by sheer volume, the most I've ever done on a particular issue. In fact, I, I discovered something really curious about about that was that it didn't matter how much I meticulously weighed how much the self-addressed stamped envelope was for a couple consecutive years it always come it always returned uh, coming up short so it was weighing more on the way back than when I weighed it out and the only answer was that there were so many postcards in there that the collective weight of the ink that was added over those postcards, and we're, we're talking about a hundred or more sometimes in a package, meant that it tipped it tipped over into postage due for that for for that particular collection. Which means at some point I discovered that you know once they start building these small little priority mail uh, boxes, uh, it was easier just to assemble them in in that. I think this was before that was even happening, so this was just lots and lots of different envelopes that I was using over that time. So, so there was, so I, I would say the, the single ish, stamp issue that I have more of in my collection than any else is the five consecutive uh, Disney stamp issues. Um, and of course, after Disney, um, there was two more years of Pixar issues as well. Uh, and they actually, Pixar actually sold a hundred postcards in a box as its own special uh, uh, brand uh, unit, brand commercial uh, item. So it was easy to just pull a lot of those out from there. Um, you'll see that there's not only the Finding Nemo stamp, but also an aquarium stamp with a clownfish there too. So even there was an opportunity to supplement the original stamp with something with a little extra. Um, 
And then of course, aside from any Disney properties, um, those stamps could be used other ways too. Uh, the Lost Boys is essentially a horror movie version of Peter Pan. Uh, the original Alice in Wonderland illustrations um, was an opportunity to use the Alice in Wonderland um, uh, stamp, but also when the Queen of Hearts stamp came out as part of the as part of a love pairing at the USPS, I found a British um, a British uh, Alice in Wonderland stamp too to be able to use that since that more closely resembles the illustration on the the postcard than the Disney version does. Um, so so the Disney stamps could be used in other ways as well, not just to to uh, refurbish the Disney brand, so to speak. Um, another film, 1939, is uh, uh, Wizard of Oz, of course. Uh, uh, Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg, they both got their own stamps and they wrote Over the Rainbow and won Oscars for it. Um, being able to find a Welcome to Kansas or a, a supplemental uh, Best Wishes uh, rainbow stamp just added a little bit of additional color to the two different Judy Garland stamps that were released over the years as well um, that I could use for this particular card. Um, uh, Kevin, the sky started a little sloppy. This is where you wonder how many you should actually use since uh, uh, you'll notice that the two Louis Armstrong stamps are different stamps. Um, and there are two Duke Ellington stamps as well as an Ethel Waters and Lena Horne stamp. So there was a lot of people to recognize and a lot of uh, real estate to cover um, for this particular uh, postcard. But uh, it, it all turned out okay, I think, but there, there really is nowhere to, to add someone if, for example, um, Rex Ingram were to get a stamp sometime in the future. Um, uh, Vertigo. Uh, this is one of my this is one of my favorites just because Vertigo is based in the Bay Area and it's one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, and I pass a lot of the locations for the, uh, for the film uh, whenever I just uh, travel around uh, the Bay Area. So just the fact that um, not only uh, the Redwoods, uh, the San Francisco uh, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the Legion of Honor um, were all represented on stamps. They are all appear in the film. Um, as well as a, a mission tower uh, bell, um, that all meant that 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 they were prime opportunities to uh, recognize the film, as well as you know, of course, uh, Alfred Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart. Um, I didn't mention the film composers issue that happened earlier, but um, uh, between Bernard Herrmann, Max Steiner, Dmitri Tiomkin, uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold, um, Alfred Newman, there were a lot of other films that I could use that. Uh, may not have featured a star that had a, uh, that had a stamp, but did have a composer since they were prodigious uh, throughout the 30s through the 60s um, for lots and lots of different studio films in classic Hollywood films. Um, this also is the one representative of a, of a the Vertigo one has, a, is the one representative of a, a stamp that's actually really expensive that I actually use that, that second uh, at the bottom, the Redwood Forest, that is a priority mail stamp. That's almost $5. I never, ever ordinarily used that, but just the fact that you had two people wandering through the Redwoods, just like Scotty and Madeline do in the movie, seemed a little too irresistible to resist. I don't, I've only done that once, but that was the one time that I did do it uh, for Vertigo. Um, and again, from here, we just start going into areas where, you know, uh, there's some Tiffany Glass, uh, Tiffany Glass uh, stamps. And so because Johnny Mercer and Henry Mancini both won an Oscar for writing Moon River, it seemed like a, a perfect opportunity to celebrate the film with all those stamps. Um, not only did uh, the Beatles appear in Yellow Submarine, uh, but they also appeared in A Hard Day's Night right around the time that they had also appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. So this seemed like a great way to recognize that uh, film and that history. Um, if you've never seen Easy Rider, you may not realize that the character Peter Fonda plays is named Captain America. So when the Captain America stamp came out as part of the Marvel set, it made a lot of sense to me. It's almost like an inside joke, um, but obviously having the Woodstock and the Chopper um, stamps make it a little bit more of a cohesive whole, um, but, that's, uh, but that's one for Easy Rider. Um, Star Wars, I was actually working for Lucasfilm uh, when the Star Wars issue came out. So it wasn't hard at all for me to collect a ton of uh, Star Wars um, postcards. A lot of them were just regular postcards that you can find on eBay or 
uh, and, and specialty areas. But what was really unusual was that Lucasfilm had actually licensed Star Wars uh, imagery for a previous stamp set at the, from the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And so I was able to incorporate that into this. So you do have sort of a maximum card dimension to it because the stamp and the, the card look identical to each other, but I also included the two different Star Wars releases that came out that year uh, from, from the USPS and Lucasfilm. And so this is probably the second set of uh, uh, cards that I have the most of is from the two Star Wars uh, releases that came out that year. Um, but of course, Star Wars means that um, you have a lot of actors, most of them whom are still alive, that you can still use for other movie postcards. Um, Leon is better known as the professional in the United States, and uh, that, uh, that starred a very, very young Natalie Portman, who's depicted in that particular stamp. Uh, Alec Guinness um, had a much an even longer career, so there were plenty of different Alec Guinness movies I had over the years uh, that I could use for his for his stamp. Since since uh, especially if you look at the Bridge on the River Kwai, it's a great film. Maybe William Holden might have a chance at a stamp in the future, but otherwise, you kind of look at the cast and you think this film may not get any representation from the Legends of Hollywood series. So you find, try to find some other way to recognize. Uh, the film through philately. Um, similarly, when Harry Potter, that uh, I think somewhat controversial uh, stamp issue came out, it, was, it wasn't hard to find some Harry Potter postcards, but I also decided to use any postcard that featured a Harry Potter actor, in this case, uh, Maggie Smith, but certainly uh, anyone from um, uh, Michael Gambon to uh, uh, Alan Rickman were, and Helena Bonham Carter all appeared on those stamps and all have lots of other movies to their credit, too. Um, and then, of course, Star Trek, uh, that came out. Because those weren't designed for a specific um, uh, TV series, they were just more uh, franchise icon iconography, um, I was able to use those for any kinds of uh, Star Wars, uh, Star Trek um, uh, cards, mostly television. But I did have a couple Star Trek movie uh, postcards as well that I used. Um, and then let's see, Oop, I lost my arrow. Okay, here we go. Uh, now, a situation like this, um, King Kong uh, does not have a, a US PS postage stamp. Uh, but I have a, several different uh, uh, King Kong uh, uh, postcards, and I've ended up using stamps in different ways. Um, the, Empire, uh, the Empire State Building was part of Celebrate the Century of the 30s. So I put the Empire State Building where he's actually standing on one card. Um, uh, the Chinese Zodiac, the Year of the Monkey, ended up working well. The, even the colors match pretty well uh, for that particular uh, stamp. And then later, um, building, a, building a Nation uh, uh, made in America, that had a stamp uh, about building skyscrapers, and that worked for yet another different uh, King Kong postcard. Um, you'll notice that Fay Ray has a stamp from Canada. So it seemed pretty fair to add her to it. Uh, you saw with Alice in Wonderland, every once in a while, I'll use a, uh, a foreign stamp if the foreign stamp offers a much more direct relationship to the film. Um, similarly, uh, there weren't going to be any Joan of Arc uh, stamps from the United States, but it wasn't hard to find some from other countries to supplement the Joan of Arc uh, first day of issue postmarks that were part of uh, Ingrid Bergman and Jose Ferrar, who actually uh, appeared in the film. So adding those little ad additional touches was it took a little a little additional research, but not not too not too much. It's, it wasn't too hard if you just know where to look and how to look. Um, speaking of foreign stamps, this is my favorite uh, 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 film related uh, cachet, and it is also the um, uh, the second oldest movie stamp in the world. Um, with uh, recognizing uh, Georges Méliès, um, uh, who was uh, an, an original innovator. Of course, Thomas Edison had an even earlier stamp as well, but he's known for so many other things other than just his his uh, his uh, relationship to his relationship to movies. So I, I have I have some Edison related stuff, but I don't count it in the same way. They don't, they don't even mention movies in on the stamp, uh, but they do on this one here. Um, and then from there, we'd start going to the 
the indirect relationship, you know, where, you know, if I've got a Halloween stamp, let's stick it on a scary movie. If I've got a Christmas stamp, um, let's use it to supplement um, a primary uh, first day of issue postmark on a Christmas movie. Um, you have uh, World War One and World War Two and other uh, other um, uh, great historic events or memorable historic events as represented on film and on stamps. Um, sometimes you're dealing with famous people like uh, Charles Lindbergh in The Spirit of St. Louis or Harvey Milk in Milk. Um, sometimes you're dealing with science fact uh, or science fiction. Uh, this is especially easy to do just because there's so many really cool space stamps out there in the world. Um, uh, animals are great. Uh, the thing I like about this one uh, for, for both the Swedish film and the American uh, noir film is I found stamps that had a very similar color scheme. You know, the, the My Life as a Dog poster has really warm colors and the, and the golds and the browns supplement that, whereas the Curse of the Cat People has a lot of grays and blues, and I found stamps that really uh, complemented that too. So they, they, they seem to almost meld better into the visual design of the postcard instead of having them pop out or contrast too much. Um, let's see, whoop, there we go. Um, and then of course you're dealing with films where, you know, again, uh, Saturday Night Fever will probably never be recognized by a stamp, but um, Disco was a perfect opportunity to do so in its own way. Same thing with 1950s um, Hot Rods and Trucks um, for Greece. Um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon doesn't have an actual tiger, but uh, it still worked well enough for uh, the Chinese Zodiac. Um, the film on the right is called The Postman uh, from Italy, and so just having, so it's a film about uh, a postal carrier uh, who falls in love, so it seemed like a perfect, uh, a perfect match for uh, a love stamp that had uh, a postal theme directly on it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the Chil Children of Paradise is one of the most beautiful films you could possibly see from the the 40s, it was actually made under the noses of the Nazis in France. So it's an, epi it's an epic, but it was also shot completely clandestinely, but it's a magnificent film. Uh, and it has, it has less to do with circus as, as it has to do with performing art and, and mime and something that's still more, more theatrical. But I love the way that this stamp worked itself into the design of the, of the, the poster quite perfectly, actually. Um, and then there's situations like, you know, why not use Animal from the Muppets for Animal House? Uh, the WPA posters that came out had some beautiful uh, Art Deco design elements to them. So having, so employing them in lots of different ways was a, a really great challenge. This was one where I could actually use um, Jerome Kern and the Showboat stamp to uh, to help um, add a little add a little flavor to this Showboat. Uh, this isn't actually a movie poster. It's a theatrical poster for the theatrical run of Showboat. Um, but that was still, I think it turned out really well. Um, uh, Enter the Dragon uh, complemented the real dragon uh, stamps that came out, what, I think about a year or two ago. Um, having uh, having uh, Christmas, Christmas uh, images as cross-stitch worked perfectly with the cross-stitching on the Fargo um, one sheet as well. And Fargo is one of those films that actually mentions stamp collecting in uh, the body of the film too. So that's always a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes you can just focus on a state, you know, uh, the greetings from America and other kinds of um, uh, landscape uh, or commemorative, uh, film, uh, commemorative stamps about states uh, works perfectly if you've got the right film uh, in the right, taking place in the right state like these do. Um, and then sometimes, you, this is where we start getting a little more esoteric, where Freeway is about, not necessarily a freeway per se, but it's a terrific film and it worked out perfectly with the, the Overview from America um, series that, uh, that came out a few years ago. That, that's still one of my favorite uh, by having uh, nature and, uh, and human-made uh, landscape, uh, abstracting them in stamps like that. It's quite beautiful. Um, and of course, uh, celebrating uh, the Twin Towers with uh, the Made in America 
stamp. Um, oh, one thing though, let me, one thing I've noticed a lot recently is you'll notice that Made in America postmark is incredibly dense. You look at something like Freeway just from a, a few years earlier and they didn't have a, an illustrated postmark. And even the illustrated ones like the signatures of the movie stars were still kind of graceful and very light. This is incredibly heavy. So if you're putting this on top of something that has a lot of imagery, then a lot of that ink just sort of blanks out a lot of that imagery. So uh, I've been I've tried to be more careful because that seems to be the trend of postmarks now is getting much thicker, much denser um, in terms of in terms of what they look what the illustrated version looks like. Um, these are triplicates, which means there are three different stamps with three different individual uh, first day of issue covers. Um, like a lot of the other multiples that you saw earlier, this is all a matter of trust. When I have two uh, postmarks that I'm really proud of, it's really, really hard to send it out um, because you're entrusting it in someone else's hands to do the right thing with the third one coming back. Every single time you send it out, I, I have to assume that something might happen uh, out there and I may not see it again. And so I I very rarely had that happen. So the idea of being able to do that again and again and being able to build visually, um, whether it's thematically because uh, because the Woodstock poster had all those individual uh, artists or sometimes delicatessen, uh, which pretty much just stands out because of the pig on the poster, but using three different pigs uh, for the first day of issue covers is something that I really enjoy doing, but you always have to sort of cross your fingers that the USPS will do things uh, correctly. Uh, they they take a long time to do it sometimes. I'm perfectly fine with that because uh, what matters most is that I get my creations back um, intact and ho hopefully looking exactly the way they turned out. So this is where we get into more abstract. So, so we're not even talking about a direct or indirect relationship to the film, but just simply the visual element of the stamp matches the visual element of the of the film poster. So this is probably the most perfect example where a, rail, a railroad roundhouse, an overview of it, looks so much like the wheels and gears from the, from the, the Art Deco illustration of the classic 1927 silent film, Metropolis. It was almost a little uncanny how much they looked like each other. And I really liked the idea of it. So this was, this was one of my favorite ones uh, in my collection. But flowers really come in handy a lot. Uh, the, sometimes there are flowers on the movie poster. Sometimes the flowers uh, don't reflect anything about the tone of the film other than it may be a romantic. But sometimes the, the, the color of the flowers is enough to ask, uh, act as a nice little supplement. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, the content of the stamp evokes in something about whether it's a, it's a dance sort of position or a milkshake that uh, that uh, supplements uh, what we see in the film, especially since I, I would love to see a Louise Brooks movie stamp. I probably will never see it. Um, and then, of course, uh, Kubrick's Lolita um, is probably something that we'll never see the light of day as far as a stamp goes. So this is the closest I'm ever going to get, uh, but I like the idea of it. Um, again, uh, the, the Quilt of G's Bend were beautiful stamps. Uh, the fact that some of them had wonderful colors that matched uh, the design of a movie poster was really exciting. Um, sometimes uh, it's just about color. You know, this National Park stamp has some really bright purples on a landscape. Uh, the, the, the design is actually from a, uh, a, a Walt Disney storyboard, um, but it also has lots of bright, beautiful purples in the landscape. And that was enough for me to combine them together. Um, again, uh, some kind of micro microbiology um, imagery uh, for um, uh, for this uh, stamp over with the alien. It's more just they seem to match pretty well. Um, so I like the idea of it. Sometimes just more of a graphic illustration supplements the the color scheme of a movie poster, and sometimes that's good enough too. Um, these are my two uh, Bibles of uh, the, the, the Scott, uh, the, the, the stamp catalog is a great way for me to remind myself of all the US stamps that are out there that I may use for a supplement. Um, and then uh, this stamp and stamps in uh, stamp collecting in popular culture uh, is a quite exhaustive and quite impressive collection of 
of how stamps and stamps, rep stamps are represented not only in movies, but uh, theater, episodic television, books and short stories, um, uh, live, live theater. Uh, it's, it's, if you have any interest in movies and or other kind of art forms, um, go ahead and look at just because the descriptions alone are really, really tantalizing. Uh, which brings me to my blog. Um, my blog is, uh, people in my life know my movie love far more than my stamp collecting love. And they always ask me, well, are you going to do a blog? But the problem is their blogs, everyone has a movie blog in my world. Um, and they're all pretty interchangeable from each other. I wanted to make something unique. This is literally the only blog anywhere about movies and postage stamps. Um, I discuss my collection. I discuss uh, I discuss my collection uh, and when postage stamp collecting comes up in movies. Uh, sometimes if stamps appear in movies, I'm interested in looking at the detail and whether if it's a real stamp, if it's a fake stamp, or if it's an inadequate postage, which sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, and then, of course, sometimes uh, going beyond um, uh, Howard's book is just simply sometimes movies just make little off the cuff references to stamps. I've seen Duck Soup for decades and seeing it the other day. I never remembered this line of dialogue before, but this is the kind of thing I love the little details um, that show up in films like Psycho or Double Indemnity or Chariots of Fire where you go. I, I don't remember that, but it was just a line. Sometimes it's a throwaway. Sometimes it's a joke. Um, but it, it adds a nice little extra dimension to a film that you've seen so many times before. So that pretty much covers me. I think the main thing to remember is, is that uh, I built my collection completely from scratch. Uh, I, I, built, I bought a couple caches and I have a few original stamps that I purchased over the years. But uh, the postcard stuff was my way of personalizing, of customizing my enthusiasm. And the nice thing about it is it doesn't require a lot of disposable income. Um, pretty much if you can buy a postcard, if you can buy the face value of a post stamp, postage stamp and have enough for the self-addressed stamped envelope, you can build your own collection based on your interests, your enthusiasms, and a little bit of research on the side. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of my my collection and my, my uh, love of stamps and uh, the trajectory of how I'll continue to, to build uh, this collection as much as I can, although obviously I'm probably speaking to the to the choir when I say that be sure to buy some USPS stamps. We need to keep it solvent. We need to keep it robust um, in these very, very difficult times right now. So, but uh, that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening. You're, you're muted, Heidi. Oi, oi, dead space. Uh, no, I was just saying that that was a fabulous presentation. And friends, if you'd like to uh, to come on camera, we would we would invite you to come on camera and, and show your faces, please. Um, that was fantastic. What creativity, Sterling. <laughs> I, I mean, it's... You, it's more anything. It's just you learn from experience, you know, over the years. So, where and so thank you, my pleasure. And w when it came to the cancellations, what did you re what did you reference in order to find, like like with the luminescent for the um the alien, you know, with your with your mushrooms or your luminescent? Like, how did you know to to send it out for that cancellation? Did you know of a website or how did you figure that out well there, there are plenty of different websites uh both usps based and other stamp collecting ones that pre-show what the what the image is going to be like so then i so then i get a head start on what films i want to look up that have a similar imagery to it so that way they kind of and then usually i'll collect them all together and then when i have the stamps in my hands i can see whether they'll fit okay, whether maybe the the movie poster is too dark, or, or the 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 orientation is not right. So I always just collect a lot of examples, and then I use the best ones when I have the stamps in my hand. Um, and that's and that's similar ch too. If if there's a if there's a a stamp that's announced about a certain person, whether it's a film personality or a music personality, 
that may have some convergence, then I try to dig up as many stamp, as many of my postcards that I have that apply. It, it usually takes a while to get them ready. So I'm, I'm always grateful for the fact that those, ish, those um, images are available much earlier in the year. And for anybody who's not familiar with the website, so one would be the USPS, and do you have another go-to website that you would point people to? You know, I I do, except I don't know the name offhand. I just remember it because of its design, but it's it's very it's very it's a very stamp collecting focused um, uh, stamp collecting focused uh, website, and it's actually much easier to. Uh, navigate when it comes to previous years. Uh, so I, I honestly don't remember offhand, except I just I I, u I use it a lot just because it's it's very handy to not only remind myself of what's coming up, but also what may have been very very recent. There there are a lot of really good stamp collecting uh, websites and resources out there for sure. Well, feel free when when we have the YouTube recording up online to. Uh to put any of those resources up, that would be fantastic. I, I, I know that there are some young people here on the call and that, and you know, they might be just starting and you may have inspired them. Friends, do we have anyone who would like to speak with Sterling? How did we, does any, well, I see Howard. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, hon. Or who was that? Oh, hold on one second. There we go. Hi, welcome. Hi. Yeah, um, thanks for mentioning my book, Sterling. It's very nice of you. Well, sorry, sorry you're, you're breaking up a bit. I didn't quite catch that. I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning my book, Stamp Collecting in Popular Culture. Nice of you. Uh, absolutely. It's an absolutely irresistible read. Even, even if it's for plays, you know, you're never going to see or as episodes of television you never ever going to watch it's still the descriptions are always really really interesting as far as how stamp collecting uh, acts as a plot point in some films or or other or other media i just wondered so whenever there's a new issue of stamps in america do you always look for the movie connection always always i, I look i look for the again the for the direct movie connection for the indirect movie connection and for the visual connection. So, so yeah, if it's a, if it's a, you know, the World War One came out, so I know plenty of World War One movies. I just had to see how many of them I actually had in my collection. Because sometimes I recognize movie posters from so many different ways uh, and areas. Sometimes I don't remember if I've actually got that postcard or not. So a lot of times I just, I just write down all the different uh, relationships that might exist, and then I just. I just pour over my, uh, it's tough just because I have the postcards that I haven't used, but then I have the postcards that I have used. So but because they're so physically separated, I have to remind myself all the different places I could be looking to find those kinds of connections for sure. Great. Do you find that is there anyone else that you you you're able to partner with or you know brainstorm with? Uh, no, I don't. I don't really have any other uh, philatelic friends, so to speak. You know, Twitter Twitter is really great to see what other people are doing in their world, and and I do in mine. Um, one thing I do, uh, I, I I Turner Classic Movies follows me on Twitter. And I, I usually embellish a lot of additional uh, movies that are happening. Uh, there, there's a hashtag called TCM Party, which means that people can watch movies on TCM all at the same time. They don't, do, they don't differentiate things by time zone. Everything is being broadcast simultaneously, which means I'll share a lot of different stamps related to a particular film as part of that dialogue. So sometimes that's a way to show how, um, how postage stamps inform and or reflect what's happening in a particular film uh, whether it's uh, because of the movie stars or because of some of the subject matter yay you're pollinating stamps into popular culture not that it's not there but you're 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 lifting the voice that's fantastic so, I just, and, and, oh go ahead. go ahead no 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 go ahead 
Well, uh, the, the, I should mention about the blog, uh, about what you see on the blog now is about a, a third of the full content that I have because I don't have a great scanner. So I usually am I'm usually hesitant on posting things until I have some pieces from my collection that are scanned. So what you see is only a fraction of what I've built that I just have yet to post. Some of them will be posted um, back with back dates from where uh, they went from when they originally uh, uh, were written. Um, but there's still a lot. I'm, I'm wondering if, if nothing else sheltering in place means I may be able to focus more on being get getting that stuff up. Uh, since I'm not, I, since I can't actually go to movies right now at all, um, so so ke so keep keep an eye on the keep an eye on the blog. But I'm going to continue to try to supplement that regularly with a lot of additional material, not only from my collection but also from uh, from films that are coming out that are new or films that I'm revisiting uh, as as using using um, using uh, stamps as a prism to view that particular film. You know. And can you repeat your blog, please? Your your address. I'll write it here in the chat box, and it'll be good for our viewers here on YouTube. Sure, it's a uh, filmatalyst.blogathon.com. Thank you. Perfect. And it is definitely worthy of a bookmark. I I have bookmarked it, and it's it's a springboard of inspiration. To be sure, and for anybody who's into Markopoli, I just I just absolutely went gaga over your cancellations. Beautiful. <laughs> what a I fun way it. to create. What a really interesting way to create Sterling. That was fantastic. More than anything, I just want to share the idea that you know the rules within philately and certain kind of traditions and certain you know if you look at all the different displays that are at a convention that are in competition. They follow a lot of really rigorous standards and the nuances and the details around them are quite astonishing. And I, and I love being able to walk around and look at them. But for people who want to kind of work a little bit outside the box and don't have the same experience or don't have the same resources, um, STEM collecting offers an opportunity for people to do anything they want if they just are motivated to do it. They have lots of different ways they can create their own niche interest or pursue their own niche pursuit. Um, that, that can be exciting for them. The, the key thing is for them to find a way to get motivated to explore it more. And the more you explore, the more you discover. I couldn't end this stamp chat on a more eloquent note. And on that, thank you, Sterling, for being our guest here on Stamp Chat. And thank you for watching both here in our live audience and on YouTube. Today's Stamp Chat was sponsored by the APS Education Department. The Education Department provides videos, learning modules, and teaching resources for philatelists of all ages and all collecting levels. Member exclusive video content available on Classroom C3A is one of the many benefits of APS membership. Learning never ends with philately. Visit stamps.org backslash learn or email education at stamps.org for more information. For more Stamp Chats, visit the APS YouTube channel where you can find over 60 presentations. Use the comment box to keep the conversation going. Inquiries and comments will be answered. While there, subscribe to our channel and stay in the know of newly updated Stamp Chats. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next Stamp Chat. Until then, connect, collect, and visit stamps.org to become an APS member. Thanks, everyone.